I am not a historian, but neither are you. So, how about we, the people, learn this stuff together? Welcome to US 101. And for today's episode, guys, we're finally going to figure out why exactly I want to keep talking about this stuff as a career. So for those of you that don't know, uh, in about three weeks time, I am going to be uh, starting my career as a grad student at, a, at UIC, at the University of Illinois in Chicago. I'm entering into a program called uh, the MAT program, or Masters in the Art of Teaching, that is, uh, that is given out uh, by the Department of History. My goal over the course of this two-year program is to learn enough so that I can be an adequate American history teacher. Okay, not not adequate. I'm trying to I'm trying to be the goat, huh? I'm trying to be the greatest of all teachers. And hopefully, two years from now, following the end of this grad school program, uh, I can look you guys in the eye via this camera and tell you I uh, I have a job as a as a U.S. history teacher. But it's not my time yet, huh? I've still got two years to go uh, before I get my first day in school uh, as a teacher. However, starting this month, um, there are going to be brand new teachers entering schools, teaching classes on their own for the first time. Okay. Students, it's not just your first day of school starting this month, but there are also teachers that are having their first day of school as well. You might even have one. You might even have a first time teacher in your class this year. So what I wanted to do for this week's episode, guys, is I wanted to talk to somebody that could explain to me uh, what it takes to be a history teacher in 2018. How do you teach history? in 2018, in this day and age. And so now that I've given you guys the proper setup, it is my honor, it is my privilege, I am beyond stoked to introduce you guys to uh, the man that over the next two years is going to be my grad school advisor. He is also going to be one of my professors, but more importantly, he's going to be a mentor, a guru, uh, a savior, a hero to me. The man holds my fate in his hands over the next two years to determine whether or not I'm going to make a good educator. Uh, guys, I want to introduce you to Dr. Robert Johnston, professor of history and the head of the Department of Teaching of History at UIC at the University of Illinois uh, in Chicago. Sir, an honor and a privilege to have you on the show. How are you? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And you're very kind, Sammy. Uh, just to make you sure you know, you have your own destiny in your hands, and we are totally delighted to have you on the program. You understand that I give you that intro because, uh, as we all know, flattery uh, will get you um, everywhere, obviously. Okay, thank you for being on the show. Sincerely appreciate it. Um, let's, let's dive into the first question. So it's not just me that's entering into this program. There are obviously uh, a ton of people across the United States that are also going to be entering programs uh, in August, in September, whenever, uh, to, to begin their journey to becoming a, uh, a history teacher, whether it be U.S. history, world history, European history, Latin, whichever. They want to be a history teacher. So my first question to you is, uh, according to you, uh, what do you think someone has to uh, sort of go through in their mind to determine that they want to be a history teacher. What what sort of boxes do they have to tick in their head before they decide to go? Okay, I, I think this is what I want to do now. Well, I think uh, ticking the boxes is probably a bit bloodless a way of thinking about it because I uh, would actually emphasize more the kind of inner commitment that you would need to have as a human being. And when I'm thinking about looking at somebody and seeing whether they very well might be a a great teacher of history, first I look at the teacher part of it. Right. And in that way, being a teacher, unlike what a lot of people think, requires a huge amount of work and commitment and dedication. I think there is a, a kind of really pernicious culture in our country that says that teachers are lazy, that especially if they're unionized, and I'm a, a big union supporter and very involved in my union at UIC, but especially if they're unionized, teachers will kind of cut corners and do whatever they can to do the least work possible. When in fact, that's not my experience at all with teachers. They're among the most dedicated of workers and professionals around. They are tireless in the kind of work and energy they put forward to their for their students. And so if we don't see that kind of commitment in embryo at the very least, we're gonna kind of worry about that. And the other part of that is, of course, if you're teaching history, you've got to care very deeply about history, what, what you arguably should have, what one well-known and kind of uh, renowned teacher, James Prococo, said, you need to have a passion for the past. 
You have to care very deeply about understanding the past, helping your students understand the past and think well and critically about it. But you also have to really care about the human beings who inhabited the times of a century ago or a millennia ago, even try to kind of commune with them to try to figure out what they're trying to communicate to us today. So one of the books that uh, that we're reading for this program that you assigned to us is uh, one by Sam Weinberg. It's called uh, Historical Thinking and Other Unnatural Acts. If you guys yourselves have not read it, I um, highly recommend you check it out. It's pretty good. Um, Professor, on page five, he writes the following. He says, what is history good for? Why even teach it in schools? My claim in a nutshell is that history holds the potential only partly realized of humanizing us in ways offered by few other areas in the school curriculum. So my question for you, Professor, is in 2018, when someone is teaching history, um, what do you feel should be their ultimate goal? in the class? What, what, what do you think they're hoping to achieve? Why why should history be taught in schools today? And, and, and what, what is the importance of teaching history in schools today? Let's take the humanization issue first, that history really can serve in a way to humanize people in the past and therefore connect us with a way of humanizing people, other people who are different from us in the present. And I deeply agree with Sam Weinberg about that. I think that there are other disciplines that can do that fairly well as, uh, as, as well. Say literature is not bad at that, anthropology and so on. But history, the idea is that you need to approach it not with your own lens, your own lens from the present, but you need to really be willing to go deep into the past and figure out what those other people were actually all about, what they were doing, what they were thinking, not in a way where we are automatically superior to them because we're so much more enlightened. That's completely arrogant. That's not humanizing at all. But in fact, in a way that says, hold on a second, these people may be really weird. They may be really strange on first glance, but they were genuine human beings. And if we try to reach out to them, it's worth our time to understand them because they actually may have some very valuable moral, political, ethical lessons to pass on to us. So that's the kind of humanization part of it. Now, there's another thing that Sam Weinberg writes about in his book, Professor. Uh, it's, it's something called presentism. He writes on page 19, quote, uh, presentism, the act of viewing the past through the lens of the present. Uh, it is our psychological condition at rest, a way of thinking that requires little effort and comes quite naturally, a.k.a. Uh, l looking at history, looking at historical figures, scenarios, stories um, through the lens of the present, not necessarily through a contextual lens, looking at it through the lens of how someone might have looked at, uh, at the scenario or the person during that particular time. Now, my question to you is um, how does presentism work today? Because I feel like in 2018, I feel like a lot of students are much more aware of things that are going on around them, um, especially uh, with the rise of movements via social media like Black Lives Matter and, and the Me Too movement. Kids are, are, are a lot more aware, much more socially conscious as to what the world is like around them, I feel. And while that's a good thing, I also think that teachers might have a harder time presenting historical figures, um, um, parts of history to these students because they might look at a lot of these historical figures through that lens of presentism and sort of buck context. Like if you look at Thomas Jefferson, for example, Jefferson, man that wrote the Declaration of Independence, one of the founding fathers, he's got, a, his legacy is, is, is very, very much cemented in American history, but a lot of students might just look at Jefferson and then ask a teacher, well, why are we learning about this guy? Yeah, he wrote the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, but then he also owned 200 slaves and didn't free any of them. Uh, on his deathbed. So when it comes to this idea of presentism, how should teachers treat it uh, in, in today's history classrooms? So that's one of the central, if not the central issue of trying to figure out how to teach history. For Weinberg, it really is the central challenge to teaching history. It's why history is an unnatural act. That said, Weinberg shows that, in fact, we can do this unnatural act. We can move beyond our own egoism, our own solipsism, and actually try to figure out how to put our own ego to rest and see other people as they are and as they were. And so the gravest sin for Weinberg is this 
presentism is putting our lens on to people of the past and assuming that our standards were their standards or that our standards should be their standards. I think I'd look at the end. I'm very sympathetic to that argument, but I wouldn't go with it all the way. I think I would see it in with maybe a different kind of lens. And that is that presentism is kind of a wild beast you have to know is there in the room, maybe to start wildly mixing metaphors, and that you have to tame, but that in fact presentism can take you a long ways in a valuable way. Because what Weinberg doesn't necessarily, I think, always understand is that for almost all of us, scholars included, but especially for people who don't have a scholarly orientation to history, the reason they care about the past is because of the way it relates to the present, the lessons it will teach in the present, the connections it has to our daily lives and our political and civic lives at this moment. And so if the very reason we care about history is because of what it tells us about the present day, then of course we are going to have our, pre our presentist lenses very much active. We can't help that. We're going to want to know why issues, events, people were relevant to us. You can say that, in fact, Jefferson's ideas of equality were bankrupt because he was so hypocritical. You may come to that conclusion, but you at least have to wrestle with the ways in which Jefferson's ideas of equality had a huge legacy in American life, arguably, in some ways, for the good, because I think it's, say, undeniable that many enslaved people and, and then former slaves took the very ideas, the very words of Jefferson, and ran with them in ways that he might have been horrified. So that's where the complexity of the past really helps us move away from just a strict condemnatory present. All right, another point that I want to bring up with you, Professor, is, is the topic of textbooks. Uh, in the classroom. Um, Weinberg, in his book on page 77, he writes, quote, textbooks dominate history classrooms, and as Peter Schrag has noted, history textbooks are often written, quote, as if their authors did not exist at all, as if they were simply the instruments of a heavenly intelligence transcribing official truths, end quote. Weinberg and also another author, James Lowen, they, they have a tendency to speak out against textbooks. They, they see textbooks as more of a hindrance in the classroom. Um, they, they are a way that uh, sort of like uh, stops any sort of creative pedagogy from, from happening in the classroom. It sort of stymies the, the teacher from, from thinking out of the box and, and, and showing history to students in, 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 in different creative ways. Um, so do, do you think that the textbook helps or, or hinders the, the teacher? Do textbooks have a place in today's history classrooms? Uh, I am somebody who's extremely sympathetic to like a constitutional amendment banning textbooks. And I say that as somebody who has uh, written a textbook, one that tried to be at least a little bit unconventional, uh, but it was a while ago and I would, I would do it very differently today, I think. Uh, so all the, all the crimes of textbooks are still there hugely. The idea that you don't show that actually historical knowledge is uncertain. Just take that for instance. Uh, textbooks are authoritative. They don't say, well, we don't know this or we're not sure about this or there are different ways of looking at this and that. They say, you know, like, this is the way it happened. And since that's fundamentally not the way to think historically, that just inculcates a completely false way of thinking about history. Take another thing, textbooks very rarely have footnotes, so you don't get a sense that doing history is a collective enterprise where you have debts and responsibilities to other people, and that also, if you say you don't, you're not so sure about a fact or you want to follow up on it, you know exactly where to go to see whether the author kind of did things right. So again, all sorts of crimes the textbooks commit, get rid of them, there are plenty of teachers who have done so and done wonderfully using primary sources, secondary sources, you know, excerpts from other scholarly historians and that kind of thing. Okay. However, lots of teachers don't have that opportunity. They may be required by their district or by their department to use textbooks. And also there are, even if you have your own autonomy in the, that regard, 
decent ways to teach against your textbook. That's James Lowen's quotation or idea again. He actually says, you know, he wrote Lies My Teacher Told Me, which is all about how horrible, horrible textbooks are. But he actually says, no, let's not throw them out. Let's use them as a way to see how history gets taught badly. Let's use the textbooks in ways that kind of deconstruct or destroy their sense of being authoritative. Let's look at the story they're telling without admitting it. And let's see where their falsehoods are. And when students do that, it's incredibly liberating. They then will go to other sources that seem authoritative, whether it's on the internet or in newspapers, and if they read newspapers anymore. And they say, hold on a second. Let's investigate this more carefully. So the idea of encountering a supposedly godlike textbook and then working against it, again, could be incredibly valuable as well. And then there's a final way of doing things, which is using more, uh, using less conventional textbooks, ones like Howard Zinn's People, People's History of the United States, or uh, Larry Schweikert and Michael Allen's A Patriot's History of the United States, one which is itself very conservative, like Zinn is leftist, and kind of array, arraying them against each other to again show how much you can actually debate seemingly the same event, whether it's Columbus or the Founding Fathers or slavery. Uh, professor, I, I, I truly can't thank you enough for, uh, for being on this episode of US 101. Last question for you, sir. A lot of these new teachers going out into the world this month, next month, they're going to be first-year teachers, first time facing a classroom on their own, their own students, their own lesson plans. Um, what advice do you have for first-year teachers so that their first year can be uh, as successful as possible? Excellent. All right. Well, let's see, I guess this is more like a commencement address. So I'll say, be all that you can be and, and think your own thoughts. But uh, the first advice I'll give is that one of our recent graduates, Ryan, I'm not sure in this case he's giving his last name for this, um, but Ryan is has got a wonderful podcast called Classroom Brews, you know, brews like beers, where he interviews a fair number of his colleagues, both in uh, currently in his teaching job now and also in uh, the teaching from the teaching of history program he graduated from uh, M, uh, the mat program at uic recently and so you can learn an awful lot about the recent experiences of new teachers through again this wonderful podcast classroom brews okay so that's one specific way more broadly the idea is that you can't be perfect at the start you can't be perfect after a year you can't be perfect after 10 years you can never be perfect. That's been all. But let's go back to that first year. If you try to be perfect, if you try to get everything right, if you try to stay up all night, all night, all night, every night, trying to get that one last source that's going to make your lesson perfect or to tweak your assignments so that they'll be foolproof, then you're going to fall apart, you're going to burn out, and your students aren't going to benefit in any case, because you really have to be there and take care of yourself, even if you know that in five or 10 years, you'll be doing so much better. So allow yourself to be imperfect. And then at the same time, allow yourself to learn, put yourself in a position where you can talk to your colleagues, talk to more experienced teachers, teachers who have actually gone through that first year and first decade and figured out in some ways how to wrestle with all these things. Amazing, wonderful words of advice, ladies and gentlemen, from Professor Robert Johnston, a professor of history at the University of Illinois, Chicago, also the director of the Teaching of History program, which I'm going to be entering into in about two, three weeks time. Professor, thank you for hanging out. Also, uh, I think that you've done a very good job on this interview. I thought I did pretty well too. So I'm hoping that uh, because this was such a great exchange of ideas and words that uh, maybe you'll consider me not having to turn in the first assignment that's based on Sam Weinberg's book, Buzzplay, maybe? Well, it is utterly clear that you have read and thought about Sam Weinberg in exactly the way I want people to do. So maybe I'd be tempted to let you write half a paper 
but I still want to see your writing. And that is it for this episode of US 101, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with me this week. Really do appreciate it. I do apologize if the uh, the, the connection, if the video on the professor's end was a bit uh, was a bit dicey. Don't blame me. Blame Skype. It's their fault. It's not my fault. I'm doing the best that I can with what I got. What do you want? <laughs> what do you want from me? But uh, hopefully you you came away with something uh, interesting and something different from this episode, an interview episode. I want to do more of those. You can follow US 101 on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, all those links down below in the description box. Guys, I'll see you next week for an all new episode of US 101. Until then, I am all done. Uh, for all of you first year teachers out there, good luck. Stay strong. Keep your heads up. Everything is going to be okay. Just know that you have all the tools at your disposal. You are brilliant. You are smart. And to all those kids that have first year teachers in their class, don't be a dick. To them. Be nice, huh? They're trying. They're trying for you, most importantly. <laughs>